Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry's lurking around too, which makes this Stuff You Should Know. Uh, one of the first, I think the first, no, I think we've talked about Iron before. The second in our ongoing saga to do an episode on each element in the periodic table. Oh, kill me. <laughs> it's going like to be so one. much fun, Chuck. No, this is a good one. Yeah, that, I thought so too. That's it for me. I'm done. <laughs> we'll see about that. But uh, we're talking today about aluminum, which is pretty much ubiquitous if you think about it. You find aluminum everywhere. I don't even need to rattle off where you find aluminum. You can figure that out yourself because mm. it's just that ubiquitous, right? Agreed. So um, one of the interesting things about it, though, Chuck, is that as much as it's like entered into our world or become like so enmeshed with our world, it is a very, very new invention as far as elements go and discovery and use. Yeah. Like, I mean, we've been using copper forever, iron forever, uh, bronze, even longer than iron, remember? Um, aluminum we've been using essentially since the 20th century. Is this the aluminum age? Yes, it and is. Do people call it that? No, but I think we no. should start calling it that. <laughs> I mean, bronze had an age, and it's, it's iron the, had an age, stone had an age. Yeah, that's a great idea, Chuck, the aluminum age. That's a wonderful idea. It really gets the point across. It does. Uh, and you mentioned that it's ubiquitous um, in use these days for sure, but it's also abundant and um as Livia, Livia pointed uh, this out because she helped us out with this one. She did a really good job on this one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, 8% of the total mass of the Earth's crust has aluminum in it, but it's not like uh, from the beginning we could just go down there and chop out a bunch of aluminum with a screwdriver and a hammer. Right. Because aluminum uh, had a, well, not a problem. It just had a, a quality that it's, uh, it bonds very easily with other elements, so that means it's reactive, so that means it's in the crust. It is, you know, parts of rock and parts of mm -hmm. other things in combination with other elements and minerals. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just like, oh, look, there's aluminum. We can just go grab it. Like, we had to figure out how to extract uh, usable aluminum from other things, uh, mainly these days and back then, uh, something called bauxite. Yeah, Bauxite is like, it's kind of like an umbrella term for naturally occurring aluminum ores, basically. Yeah. But the, the problem with aluminum, like a lot of metals and minerals um, like show up in nature as ores and we can extract them. The, the difficulty is that aluminum is so reactive, it really, really meshes with the other mineral or the other rock or the other metal. Um, and it's really tough to get apart. Kind of like uh, poor Wilford Brimley in The Thing. It's like that enmeshed. <laughs> oh, man. I'm feeling better now. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got this bauxite, and we know about it. We know that there's something useful in it, but we didn't know how to get it out. And for a long time, people had noticed, like, oh, there's all sorts of stuff you can do with this, um, this bauxite that we'll call alum, which is a kind of aluminum sulfate made with potassium. People have been using that for about seven, 8,000 years now. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. Like, uh, oh, of course, the Egyptians, they put uh, all kinds of things in makeup, as mm -hmm. we've talked about before. Uh, aluminum or the, that potassium aluminum sulfate is one of them. Uh, used often in dyes, used for dressing wounds. Um, I think you can also find aluminum in clay. So yeah. for many thousands of years, they were using... Uh, aluminum st strengthened clay to make uh, harder and stronger pottery. Yeah, you can't break it. It's like an unbreakable can't. comb. <laughs> unbreakable what? Comb. Like a hair comb? Yeah, there's a, oh. I think it's a brand name even. Oh, really? I've never mm -hmm. heard of it. It, it. It just invites you to break it, and it, it right. eventually does break, <laughs> by the way. But it's hard to break. I got gotcha. you. So, yes, people were using it for a while. And by the way, as an aside, there's a... Um, I don't want to say famous, but there's a noteworthy artifact that was discovered in the tomb of a, a general, Zhu Chu, who lived in China about 1,700 years ago. And it's a belt, and it's made of aluminum. 
And it's what you would refer to as an out-of-place artifact or oopart, mm -hmm. which is something that kind of bucks our understanding of history and time. Like, that should not exist because this was the 3rd century CE, and like it wasn't until— Like you find until, a remote control in, you know, the Old West or something like that? Exactly. That would, yeah. be, that would be a very significant out-of-place artifact. This one's still right. pretty significant, so much so that they're like, we think this is an archaeological prank, like a joke. Wow. Uh -huh. Like somebody was like, this is really going to blow their minds. And it did. Right. But most people are like, this is so inexplicable. There's no way that it's real. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But still inexplicable. Yes. That's one of the things that makes it awesome. Yeah, sure. But the, the, the upshot of my whole point was we knew that there was something useful in there. And as far as the chemistry world goes, it's not enough to just know it's there. They have to isolate it. They're just fanatics about it. And they said that about doing that in the 19th century, right? Yeah, there was uh, one chemist in particular named Antoine uh, Lavoisier. Yeah, Very nice, yeah. Uh, obviously French. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hey, you know, this aluminum oxide, uh, or I think they were calling alumina at that point, mm -hmm. you know, we can probably extract this stuff. Wasn't able to, uh, but not too long after, in 1808, there was a British chemist named uh, Sir Hen Humphrey Davy, who, uh, and he actually named named it, um, well, we'll get to, to the naming thing in a second. It goes through some stages. It was, to him, it was uh, alumium. Uh-huh. That was his first name for it. And then he wrote a book uh, of elements, elemental and chemistry, I'm sorry, chemical philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, four years after that. And at that point, it was spelled aluminum. Mm -hmm. um, but then later on, uh, like four years later, in the quarterly review, there were a bunch of British chemists who were just like, I don't like the ring of aluminum. It doesn't sound British enough. So they went with uh, aluminum with mm -hmm. an extra I. Mm -hmm. And that was... Basically what people called it for a long time, uh, except for Americans who were like, you know what, we're using both of these terms. We really like aluminum. Um, can we, it's in the dictionary, it's in Webster's Dictionary as aluminum. Can we just settle this? And in 1925, finally, the American Chemical Society said, yes, we are going to say it's aluminum. Uh, and so Americans and Canadians are the only people who call it that for some reason. Yeah, everybody else calls it aluminum. Yeah, they stuck with it. They really did. They they really stuck with it for sure. So um, that Humphrey Davy, going back to him, uh, probably one of the reasons he came up with different spellings was because he was fresh off of his self-experimentation with nitrous oxide. Oh, yeah. He was the guy who called it, oh, excellent airbag. Remember him? Mm -hmm. So he was the one who said, there is a m an elemental useful metal here in this, this cruddy ore. And he described it before anyone had ever even isolated it. But in the world of chemistry, you wouldn't call Sir Humphrey Davy the discoverer of aluminum. In chemistry, to discover something, you have to have isolated it in its pure form. And there was a, an early attempt to do that. I think uh, there was a guy named uh, Hans Christian Ørsted, who in 1825 came very close, but it, he had an impure isolated aluminum. And then very triumphantly, Friedrich Wohler, um, or Wohler, I think, um, yeah. came up with pure um, aluminum two years after that. Yeah, it's the old uh, chemistry tradition that in order to be named the discoverer, you have to extract it and then roll it up in a ball and hit someone with it. <laughs> That's right. That's the tradition. That's right. Uh, but it was really expensive to do. Mm -hmm. So for the first, and it's kind of funny to think about now because uh, they've gotten so good at, at making aluminum. Uh, it's obviously used in so many different things and it's uh, fairly inexpensive, um, but back then it was a luxury item. So uh, aluminum at first was known as the Medal of Kings, and Napoleon loved it. And he was like, just think of what we could do with this stuff in the military. It's like, it's fairly strong. It's very light. Um, I think, you know, the lightness was such a huge uh, attractive quality for aluminum, still mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And he was like, we, we need this stuff in uh, here. I even want to eat off of it. So make some cutlery for me, and I'll just keep very select sets of this stuff for me and my very special guest and everyone else will just dine on silver with silver spoons and we'll use this aluminum. Mm -hmm. And they were just going crazy for aluminum. It was very uh, kind of funny to look back at how it was a luxury metal in its earliest days. It definitely was. And one reason why is because even though uh, Voller had um, come up with a method for 
for um, extracting pure aluminum, it was really labor intensive. It was really hard to do and you didn't get very much from it. So it, that made it a very precious metal, especially when, like you said, you had people like Napoleon III bankrolling um, investigations into, into getting more and more aluminum, right? Um, and one of the reasons why, I did not know this, but there's probably people out there who do, that there is an aluminum pyramid capping the Washington Monument that was put, it was installed when the monument was built in 1884, finished, is be, in part because America was showing off. Yeah. In 1884, it was still a very um, luxurious good, and they had the six-pound aluminum period, pyramid placed on the top, and it was so difficult still at that time to extract aluminum that uh -huh. that represented one quarter of the annual production of all the aluminum in the world that was produced that year, that one six-pound pyramid. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Eight inches and six pounds, and they're like, get a load of this. Wait till they see this thing. Yes, it's like a bunch of beer cans mashed together. <laughs> exactly. That's the funniest part. This is 1884. They paid like 7500 bucks in today's money for it, which seems kind of cheap to me. But yeah, um, agreed. two years later, we got so good at, at extracting aluminum, we came up with another process, which we'll talk about in a second, that that pyramid went from like hero to zero almost yeah. overnight. Yeah. But, it, you know, it also served a purpose because, well, uh, everyone knows aluminum is very anti-corrosive, so... That's a nice topper for a monument, um, sure. and it also served as a lightning rod. So it, it served a purpose, but it was a, for sure a brag. Right. Um, but like you said, it went um, kind of to a, a staple thing very quickly once uh, some very smart people got to work um, refining this process. Um, one was Charles Martin Hall, uh, an Ohioan. He's very Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say Paul Harrell. Herul? How would you pronounce that? Herul? Herul? <laughs> I think you might actually say the T in that one. I'm not sure. Herul? Okay. H-E-R-O-U-L-T, uh, H -E -R -O -U -L -T, uh, another Frenchman. Yeah. Um, they independently in 1886 invented this technique that they have now uh, has been codenamed after them as the hall Herol process mm -hmm. uh, in which you dissolve aluminum oxide in molten cryolite mineral. Right. Pass a current through there. We've talked about uh, those kind of processes before. And I believe the Frenchman actually filed the patent uh, about a month and a half before Hall, but Hall proved that he had come up with it uh, previously. And so they worked it out. They shared credit. Uh, they even ended up dying in the same year. Yeah. I guess they really wanted to share everything. <laughs> right. So they said, let's just die together as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, they both passed away in 1914. And uh that wasn't the end of the process, though. I think someone else came along and really refined it. Yeah, and that, that was not only not the end. That was just the beginning. That process is still in use today. And then, like you said, a, a third guy, Carl Josef Bayer. Would you say Josef? Oh, probably. I think, yeah. Okay. Let's go with Josef. <laughs> Carl Josef Bayer in 1887, the next year, came up with a, a way to get aluminum oxide, which was the base... Um, form of aluminum that uh, you start out with in the hall Heralt process. The next year, somebody came along and figured out a better way to get aluminum oxide from bauxite. So in the span of a, a year, essentially, we mm -hmm. went from aluminum being a precious metal to having an industrial process in place that we still use today. That's incredible. That's why we live in the aluminum age today. I just think the timing of the whole thing is so amazing. And I saw it explained in part because people were so well aware that aluminum was light and strong and conductive. Those mm. are really desirable properties. They wanted this metal really bad. So it was a real target in the chemistry world, which explains why Hall and Heralt both came up with the same process independently the same at the same time. But the fact that you put that together with Bear's discovery, and it just all congealed all at once rather than over the course of, you know, decades and decades. Yeah. I just find that very interesting. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, in fact, Hall in 1888 uh, helped found a company that's still around today. Uh, back then it was called the Pittsburgh Reduction Company. And now it's known as the Aluminum Company of America, uh, Alcoa. I'm sure we have listeners, plenty of listeners in Pittsburgh that work for Alcoa. Very mm -hmm. big uh, company. And uh, the price of aluminum really went down. Um 
So, I mean, if you want something to go from a luxury to, like, something that you crush against your head from a beer can, mm-hmm. uh, you go from uh, almost $5 a pound in 1888 to 78 cents in 1893, and then all the way down to about 20 cents a pound in the 1930s. Yeah, so in today's prices, it's going from $665 a pound to $5.45 a pound in just a few decades. That's how how radical and just world-changing that process was and is. All right. I think that is a heck of an intro. All right. Well, let's take an ad break then, I say. Some podcasts might stop there, you know. Yeah, but we'll, we're going to keep going. <laughs> All right. We'll be right back. All right. So one of the things, Chuck, that we talked about was um, you mentioned that you you melt cryolite. I think it melts at a thousand degrees Celsius and then you melt aluminum. So the temperature has to be even hotter than that, like really, really hot. And then you pass a really strong electrical current through that. And to do all this, it's really, really energy intensive, as yeah, we'll still see. Is. Yeah. So one of the other things that supported the the boom in aluminum was that the electrical grid and um, ways of creating and generating and getting electricity from place to place was also developing simultaneously in the United States as well. And that really helped a lot. Yeah, big time. Uh, and in fact, a lot of aluminum plants early on were built near dams. They were like, let's just, you know, let's really make this efficient mm-hmm. and, and set up camp right next to that dam over there. Uh, so, you know, we should probably go over some of the modern uses of aluminum. Um, aluminum is, uh, like we said, has so many great properties, but it is fairly soft and weak um, in and of itself. I mean, it makes, and we'll talk about foil and beer. I can't stop talking about beer cans. <laughs> um, and it's great for that stuff. But uh, if you want to use it in, you know, commercial settings, you can make commercial aluminum. You just have to mix in a little iron, maybe a little silicon, and it makes it much stronger. Um, and there are like all kinds of ways that you can uh, alloyify, is that a word? <laughs> uh, I think it works. <laughs> All right. You can alloyify aluminum <laughs> to do things like, you know, build an airplane. Um, and in fact, that's the Wright brothers. You might be thinking that airplane was made of wood, and it was. But the engine, and I never knew this, uh, was made of 92% aluminum mm-hmm. because they needed horsepower. They needed a strong enough engine to get that little wooden frame off the ground, uh, but they couldn't make it like out of, like you would a car engine because it'd be way too heavy. So they needed to be less than 200 pounds, produce that eight horses, and German car makers were starting to uh, to use aluminum for their engines, and they said, you're onto something. They ended up using uh, 8% copper to the 92% aluminum, mm-hmm. and they got that thing off the ground. Yeah, they turned to their mechanic, Charlie Taylor, and it needed to be no more than 200 pounds and produce 8 horsepower, like you said. He delivered one from scratch that weighed 180 pounds and produced 12 horsepower. So Charlie Taylor really came through. I know we talked about him in the Wright Brothers episode we did. Was that a two-parter? Mm, I don't know. I want to say it was, but I make a lot of stuff up in my head. <laughs> uh, so, you know, come World War I, uh, not too long after, they were making full uh, airplanes out of metal. Um, like aluminum replaced wood very, very quickly because you had wood and fabric airplanes. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, that was the best they could do at the time, but aluminum is so much stronger and you could go a lot faster and do all kinds of things you couldn't do with wooden fabric. Yeah. Uh, and there's even, uh, Livia found a, a gentleman at the National Air and Space Museum, the Smithsonian, who was like, if it wasn't for aluminum, we wouldn't have the planes and spacecraft we have today, kind of period. Yeah, and so that really gets across one of the big prized things about aluminum. It's strong, but it's also light. It's not quite as strong as steel, but it's much lighter than steel, I think three times lighter. So its strength to weight ratio is much better, which means it, it requires a lot less either horsepower in your your 12 horsepower engine or a lot less, um, um, I guess, uh, solid rocket fuel 
to get your, your um, rocket off of the ground because you're using aluminum. So that's pretty great. There's another quality of it that's um, allowed aluminum to really kind of help us is um, its conductivity. Yeah, if it was equally as conductive as copper, it would have fully replaced copper at this point hmm. uh, because of how, how much easier aluminum is to, you know, to get. Uh, but it's about two-thirds as, as good as copper, which is still great, very conductive. Uh, but it's a third as heavy, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, that The problem there is, you know, you're going to need aluminum wire that's about one and a half times the diameter of uh, copper if you want it to perform the same. So mm-hmm. it is lighter, but that's a lot bigger. So they couldn't, um, they tried to for a little while, but they couldn't just like go in and replace copper in households and stuff because the wiring is too big. Uh, they do use it for uh, overhead and underground transmission because, uh, you reinforce it with steel, and it can be bigger in diameter. It's not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think in the 60s and 70s, they were trying it in houses uh, because copper was really expensive. I think it worked well, but the connections uh, ended up uh, where you connect it together ended up being a fire hazard, so they did away with that. Yeah, what happens is in the when where the wiring goes into, like, your outlet, your socket, right, in the back. Um, the aluminum expands and contracts much more than copper does, so it loosens over time, and when it gets loose enough, it'll arc. And an electrical arc is way worse than just a, an electrical current because the electricity encounters gas, the atmosphere, and it shoots up to like 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit and causes fires. So if you, have, uh, if you buy a house with aluminum wiring, like from the 60s or 70s, your insurance company is probably going to be like, if you want insurance on this house, you're going to have to totally rewire it. That's right. And now we can talk about beer cans. Finally. Because that is what started to happen um, all the way back in the late 1950s. Um, you know, the old cans were made of usually uh, tin, sometimes steel. Mm-hmm. And there was a very forward-thinking company in Hawaii called the Hawaiian, uh, Hawaii Brewing Company. And they tried it out on their Primo beer. And they said shipping this stuff is a lot better. It's a lot cheaper. We can ship it to the mainland, no problem. But uh, the can linings that they were using at the time, um, there was a chemical reaction going on between the beer and the can. It ruined the beer, bankrupted the company, uh, but it did not die there because Coors was right on their heels. They were already working on the same thing, and they perfected it uh, just a year later in 1959 and basically said the same thing. It's like, this is a lot cheaper. Uh, it's uh, easier to and you know lighter, obviously, than glass bottles. Uh, it actually helps the beer um, deprive the beer of light and oxygen better than bottles. Mm-hmm. And Coors started the whole thing, um, as far as beer goes, followed very quickly by RC Cola on the soft drink side. And then it was aluminum can city as far as soft drinks and canned anything goes, basically. Uh, but if you remember when, like, we were kids, those same aluminum cans just were felt heavier and thicker. Uh, it's because they were. They've they've refined the process and made it much thinner over the years. But those old cans, because I was like, were those tin? Um, they weren't. They were aluminum. They were just a lot heavier back then. Right. So um, today, aluminum cans are so useful that 20% of the entire global supply goes to making aluminum cans, which is pretty amazing. And oh, yeah. the other thing about it is it's highly recyclable, as we'll see. You, um, it has what's called infinite recycl- recyclability. Like it doesn't degrade in the recycling process, and it, it requires way less energy, time, and money to uh, recycle aluminum cans. So much so that I read that the can of, say, like Coke or beer or whatever you're drinking was probably in a, the exact same form in a different life 60 days before. Each can has about a 60-day life cycle from sale to use to recycling to reprocessing to repackaging to going back on the store shelf again isn't that amazing but it's not like they just wash out the same can it's completely disintegrated so it's not the exact same can but it was in some way that same can before it's like that ship we talked about and does your body replace itself if you slowly replace each part of the ship when you replace everything is it still the same ship same question applies to aluminum cans it turns out yeah I mean, we might as well finish up on recycling uh, and just say that uh, we've tried to beat the recycling drum over the years. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are some problems with the recycling process for a lot of stuff. 
I know glass is particularly problematic, but aluminum is one of those that they have really, really figured out how to do it in a, in a great, efficient way. Yeah. And it's so recyclable, mm-hmm. and it's very easy to recycle, um, yet only uh, 50% of aluminum, and this is just cans, just the cans that people drink, only 50% of those still are recycled. That's so nice. Um, so just, we implore you, we try not to get on the old high horse, but if you're not going to recycle anything else, please just recycle those cans. It's so easy, and it really, really makes a big diff. Yeah, again, it requires 5% of the um, carbon emissions to recycle aluminum pound for pound than it does to process it and create it initially. 5%. Yeah, it's, not, it's not a scam. It's not just going to some landfill. Like, they've really got aluminum recycling down pat. So you can feel good about throwing that can and the recycling and knowing that some other uh, jerk next to you will be drinking from almost that same can, what, two months later, you said? Yeah, about six six to eight weeks. Yeah, that is just a wonderful thing. So uh, recycle that aluminum. There's a, a very um, often cited stat that I think goes all the way back to 2001. I couldn't find a more updated one. But um, we throw away so many aluminum cans that we could rebuild the entire U.S. commercial air fleet every three months with that aluminum. Mm. Just thrown mm-hmm. away. And the other thing talking about is recyclability. If, if you can just recycle aluminum over and over and over again, eventually we have enough that we've mined and processed that we don't have to mine and process it anymore because it's all getting recycled. So we could we're stop mining. We're close to mining. that now, right? Uh, no, not if we're, st- we're only recycling 50% of our cans. That means we have to... We have to supplement the recycled material with another 50% of new cans. Yeah, but about 75% of all aluminum ever used is still being used. Okay, yeah, that's true. So, sure, I guess 25%. There's some missing math in there somewhere. Well, that's – so we're talking cans and then we're talking all aluminum. Oh, well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, apparently the building industry has a much higher recycling rate. That's right. So good for them. You want wow, do you want to take another break? Uh yeah, let's do it. Okay. Well here we are, everybody, taking another break. All right, everyone. Uh, cans are great. We love those cans. <laughs> uh, but I love, and I always have loved, aluminum foil. I don't know what it is about it. I think it's the, I think it's the foldability of foil. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just love it. I've I had a roommate who used to make uh, eat candy and make little things out of gum wrappers, mm. little little swords and things, mm-hmm. and poke people. And I just I don't know. I've always loved aluminum foil. Uh, I even make the mistakes sometimes still calling it tinfoil, even though I don't think it was at all even around when I was a kid even. I'm not Maybe sure. Maybe I just picked Pro- it up from my grandmother or something? Probably. I mean, everybody calls it tinfoil still. Yeah, I guess so. Even Adam Savage on his uh, his Japanese foil ball video called it tinfoil. Did he? Uh, yeah, which we'll talk about in a sec. But um in 1910, there was a manufacturer, an aluminum manufacturer, that said, all right, I can figure out how to get this aluminum into these big rolled sheets, and we can package candy in it. We can package tobacco in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, before you know it, in 1913, it hit the U.S. in the form of Lifesavers uh, candy rolls and other kinds of candy bars. And then it didn't take long before, like, the 1920s when it was used as, you know, the rolls of foil that um, very useful. I still try to to not use it because you know, uh, to, you know, cutting like uh, reducing is the first thing in reduce, reuse, recycle. So it's not like I'm just like ripping tin foil off all the time just to play with it. Mm-hmm. But it is a very handy thing to have in the house. If you toss that aluminum foil ball in the recycling, it doesn't matter. You can play with it all day long. Heck yeah, because it's infinitely recyclable. I don't know if we yeah. said that or not yet. We've a bunch of times, but reducing is still better. Sure. That's why it's number one on the list. But it's so hard, Chuck. To not play with aluminum foil? Yeah, to reduce. Yeah, it is. So um, 
we can't not talk about the tinfoil hat, too. Like, think about it. No one ever says the aluminum foil hat. They say foil no. or tinfoil. Apparently, the Vice magazine traced it back to a 1927 story by Al Jewish Huxley's brother, Julian. Um, I can't remember what it's called, and I knew it. It's a great name, too. Sorry, everybody. But he develops this, this form of uh, mass control, the scientist, the main character, and he uses a cap of metal foil um, to prevent that mind control being used on him. And as far as Vice magazine is concerned, that's where the whole thing began. Whose brother was this? Al Jewish Huxley, the Doors of Perception guy. I think you added, you did the uh, Josh Adavell. Al Jewis, yeah, that's true. I've always done that. I don't think I've ever <laughs> said his name other than Al Jewis Huxley. Oh, I'm surprised you don't say aluminium because they've added the vowel for you. I refuse to because I'm American <laughs> through and through. I bleed red, white, and blue, Chuck. That's right. Uh, all right, so that happened in what, 1927? No, seriously, please call a doctor. My blood is white sometimes. It's <laughs> No. It can't be healthy. You're fine. You're fine. Uh, that was in 1927, and then in World War II, there was a – um, a propaganda broadcaster named William Joyce, who talked about um, tinfoil hats protecting against shrapnel. Mm -hmm. So that was another use, right? Yeah. Um, that guy was a Nazi propagandist who uh, was trying to undermine the British um, morale. He was a real jerk. They hung him, named Lord He Ha Ha. Yeah. I always want to say Lord He Ha. Actually, I want to say Lord He Ha Ha because I always add an extra vowel. But the, the upshot of all this, I don't even know if that applies in this case, but um, how about to wrap up this section, like a piece of aluminum foil, if uh -huh. you've ever watched Better Call Saul, um, the original, I guess the first couple seasons, his brother, what's his brother's name? i never seen the show. Oh, okay. Well, Michael McKeon plays his brother very well. He's a big jerk. Mm. And, but him. he has um, an electromagnetic sensitivity. Uh, which they explore in depth, and he wraps himself in, in magnetic foil very anytime he wants to get out of the house. Um, but an MIT study in 2005 found that doing that would actually amplify electromagnetic frequencies rather than um, prevent them from entering your body or head. No good, then. Yeah, tinfoil hat does not work, everybody. Uh, I referenced the Japanese foil ball uh, thing, and it's apparently one of these internet challenges from like five years ago that I had never heard of. Me either. So I immediately went and looked it up. And, um, you know, it's it's basically you take a, a big, you know, crinkly ball of uh, foil and you start hammering on it until you do it so much that it ends up, you know, if you just use the hammer, you can even get it down to a, a pretty smoothish um, aluminum ball. Mm -hmm. uh, I did see others, though, that, you know, then they would get out some grinders and some sandpaper and stuff. That feels like cheating. Well, I mean, it depends on what you want to up with. They, they, they could have stopped and just said, all right, here, this is, like, really cool. Mm -hmm. But then when you, like, sand it down and use the grinder and use, like, polish and stuff, you can literally take it to the point where it's a a very, very shiny. It looks like almost like a solid chrome mm -hmm. steel ball. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really cool and fun to see. And I think I want to try to do it. I think you shouldn't. You should post it on Instagram. Maybe. I mean, if, if I'm, well, I'll post it either way. I was going to say if it's a success, but it's even more fun if I screw it up. <laughs> exactly. <probably. laughs> totally. But that gets across how aluminum can be decorative. So like a lot of um, shiny paper or shiny materials that are just shiny on one side, they're coated in aluminum because they figured yeah. out a technique to flash vaporize it in a vacuum. And it just goes whoop, and coats whatever happens to be in there with it. That's the process they use it. Flash vaporizing aluminum, you got to feel like some sort of god on earth when you're able to do that, when you press that button, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's used in all kinds of buildings, um, kind of starting with in the 1930s uh, with New York City with uh, the Empire State Building. It used a lot of aluminum. Uh, it is used a lot in car making. They use about 18% of all aluminum is used in auto making these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, I mean, what else? Like you mentioned the decorative paper, it's in toys, it's in medicine. Um, it can be an antacid if it's aluminum hydroxide. Yeah. Most over the counter uh, antacids are made of that. Yeah. It's still used uh, topically, um, just like they did back in the old days for burns and wounds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it's still in makeup. Yeah. And it plugs up your pores and your antiperspirant. Yeah. Which, uh, we just talked about in what? History of hygiene. That's right. 
and and apparently, and I always thought that that was uh, not good at all. But uh, Livia pointed out in that podcast, and you know we can talk about it some here too that it is had is it has not been proven uh, decidedly that aluminum is really really bad for your body in the quantities that you would normally have aluminum. Yeah, there was a scare back in about 2010, 2011 that the aluminum in your antiperspirant was going to give you breast cancer, and apparently that was just made up on the internet, and studies don't actually support that. The new one is that aluminum, and I, sh- I shouldn't say new because I think it kind of started in the 60s and 70s, that um, there was some sort of correlation between the tau protein tangles um, and plaques that are associated with Alzheimer's and aluminum consumption. Was it in like mice or rats that they, they found this in, I think? I think it was mice, but they were, I think they were like injecting mice. Right. And they ended up saying like, humans are never going to come into contact with this much aluminum. Right. Just from, you know, being on the earth and using aluminum. Um, I think they have found that if there's like aluminum in the drinking water supply of your town, mm-hmm. which has happened and is a real problem, mm-hmm. then if you have Alzheimer's, it can accelerate it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't think they have still linked it to like causing full stop Alzheimer's. No, but they have identified it as a neurotoxin because remember how it's super reactive? It does the same thing with cells in your body, including your neurons. So it can really mess your brain up and, and it causes um, double strand breaks, which messes up your DNA. So in that cell... Uh, divides into another one, that new cell's DNA is messed up too, hence tumors too. So there are problems with aluminum. Like you said, it is in the water supply. It's really in a lot of surprising places. And we put those things in our body. Um, yeah. Again, want to point out, b- before the 20th century, this this didn't happen. People weren't like ingesting aluminum. It just it didn't exist in that form on earth, right? That's a new thing. But it does seem that despite it not being used in any biological process, despite it being very new, and so the human body has not really encountered this and gotten used to it, our kidneys are supposedly very, very efficient at flushing aluminum right out of the body about as fast yeah. as it comes in. Yeah. I, th- I mean, I think that's, that's impressive. It is, and that's the that's where it stands right now. I don't think anyone has, like, closed the book and said, well, we're just not going to study this anymore. Right. Uh, but right now, that's where things stand. Yes. One problem with aluminum is that there have been instances um, fairly recently about aluminum hoarding. Uh, In the early 2010s, the Goldman Sachs Company, Mm -hmm. they bought a warehouse complex outside of Detroit, Michigan, and they stored aluminum for um, producers and for banks and for people who traded aluminum. And they said, uh, you know, at a certain point in the years that followed, buyers were trying to get a hold of aluminum and all of a sudden, what used to take, you know, a month, a month and a half to get was taking a year or more to get. Mm-hmm. And it was a real problem. And there were people like beer companies and soft drink companies were saying, what's going on? This is costing us millions and billions of dollars yeah. waiting on these uh, aluminum delays. And Goldman Sachs was like, hey, you know, we, we don't have enough forklift drivers and trucks. And that's the problem. It's not us um, telling everyone to hold on to that a- aluminum to make a false supply uh, issue, so we can charge more for it. Right. Um, but the New York Times came along and said, "No, that's exactly what's going on. Um, you're just increasing profits by creating a false supply." Yeah. What's interesting is the aluminum market, aluminum as a commodity, is in like the supply is tracked so closely that you know just ho- little instances of hoarding like that, if it happens like enough times, it can it can affect like the price pretty easily and the supply can just stop. People do that when it's really cheap. They'll do what Goldman Sachs did and just buy up supply and sit on it until it goes up in price because in part you're sitting on the supply and then you mm-hmm. just kind of slowly reintroduce it to the market so that you don't drop that high price while you're still raking in the dough by selling the aluminum you have. And to be fair, Goldman Sachs was far from the uh, only investment bank doing this, running these kind of sure. warehouses. But this is the early 2010s, fresh off of the financial meltdown that Goldman Sachs mm-hmm. got bailed out for. So everybody was, they they were just pointing out Goldman Sachs alone. Yeah. That was fair. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> That's as fair as we could That's be. It's called tit for tat, buddy. In this case. Uh, even just a couple of years ago in 2021, um, they found um, aluminum hoarding going on in Vietnam mm-hmm. uh, to the tune of about up to $5 billion worth of aluminum. 
Um, they said this may be the largest aluminum hoard that's ever been. And like you said, people are just, you know, doing the wrong thing. And the prices really fluctuated quickly. I think it was a low of about $1,500 a ton uh, during the pandemic shutdown. And then they went to about $3,500 a ton uh, just a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very it's a big diff. It's very sensitive. The price is very sensitive. China is a big producer now, and they've figured out that when they throttle or or dial back supply, they can change the price pretty easily themselves too. So it's yeah. a it's a strange market, especially if we stop mining it. I I want I want to know what's going to happen to the price when we just say okay, we have our aluminum supply, and now we're just circulating it um, throughout the the economy. Um, like is yeah, that gonna, recycling? Yeah, is that going to make it more expensive, less expensive? I'm I'm curious what will happen to that. Well, the cynical human in me thinks that they will then find a way to uh, maximize profits there mm -hmm. to by doing something untoward. Probably. You don't have much faith in commodity traders, huh? <laughs> I know. So one other reason, Chuck, to make it to this circular economic status for aluminum where we've mined everything that we need and we're just reusing the stock um, is because bauxite mining is really, really bad for the environment. Most mining yeah. is, but any kind of strip mining is really bad because it just completely depletes the, the land of everything it needs to keep itself going. Yeah. Uh, bauxite also... Um, really pollutes water supplies too with other heavy metals. Um, and then also, uh, because it's so energy intensive, just the bauxite mining produces 3% of the world's direct uh, CO2 emissions. That's just the mining, not startling, not processing it into aluminum, just the mining alone does that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, 3%. I mean, three is a small number, mm -hmm. but we're talking about all of the CO2 emissions on planet Earth yeah. coming from one single um process. That's, that's staggering. Yeah. And so start looking around. If you're like, just ask yourself before you throw something away, is this aluminum? If the answer is yes, throw it in a recycling bin. Yeah. And, uh, you know, World War II, there were kids uh, turning in their gum wrappers for the <laughs> war effort to get aluminum recycled. So, so cute. Uh, be more like World War II kids. <laughs> Someone apparently suggested melting down the Washington Monument cap during that time, but everybody just kind of didn't say anything about it just let it oh did die. they really yeah somebody did and people are like how do you even know that <laughs> right that's a really arcane piece of trivia yeah okay well that's it for aluminum everybody um and that means of course it's time for listener mail uh i'm gonna call this airplane etiquette mm -hmm. um did you read this one yet i don't think no i didn't this is fresh off the presses, but I'm also going to call it uh, Am I the A-Hole? Because this is sort of what this um, person is asking a little bit mm -hmm. um, with this airplane situation that uh, this gentleman was on recently. And is asking for advice and like, did I do the wrong thing? Oh, boy. So I'm going to read sort of a uh, shorter version. Okay. Uh, but but needless to say, uh, Frank is, is really into the show and very thankful for it. So uh, Frank and his wife were uh, on a Comfort Plus flight. Okay. Uh, from our good friends at Delta <laughs> recently. And uh, they were in the, uh, you know, the aisle seat and the middle seat. Uh, I believe Frank was on the aisle. He's tall. His wife took the middle seat. And they were boarded and seat belted when a passenger assigned to the window seat arrived. Uh, as a courtesy, my wife and I turned our legs sideways so he would have an easier time sliding past us. Mm -hmm. But he said that he doesn't feel comfortable sliding past people like that and asked us to get up and let him in. Uh, I mentioned there was plenty of room for him to slide past since we were in Comfort Plus, but he insisted we get up. So we unbuckled, we got up, and we let him in. Uh, when we were preparing to land, uh, about 10 minutes out, uh, the same passenger decided they needed to use the restroom. He asked my wife and I to get up again to slide out. Uh, I was watching a movie at the time, so I had to pause the movie. Oh, my God. Fold the uh, arm that holds the screen no. back uh, into the seat. You know, sometimes they come out of the arm there. Yeah. And then fold up my tray holding my drink into the seat so he could get out. Uh, I did this, turned my leg sideways so he could slide out. And this angered him, and he showed his displeasure by sliding past us angrily and shaking his head mm -hmm. in an exaggerated manner. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is where we are so far. Okay. Uh, he returned from the restroom uh, and then asked again if we would get up this time and let him in. I mentioned to him that he slid past us 
getting out quite easily. So can't you just do that sliding back in? Oh my goodness. He said, no, I feel uncomfortable sliding past. Mm -hmm. He called the flight attendant to come over. And the flight attendant arrived and was fairly puzzled. Uh, I think he was, um, the flight attendant was confused as to what was going on. I knew the situation was beginning to stress my wife out and quite frankly, me as well. Not wanting to cause any more stress issues because we were landing, I relented, unbuckled and stood up again and my wife did the same. Mm -hmm. So before we get into this, just may finish this last part, which is what bothers me is the, uh, he kept saying he's not comfortable doing so uh he never said uh why he was uncomfortable and that he just insisted that people unbuckle and stand uh, what about my comfort and my wife's comfort what if we weren't comfortable unbuckling and getting up um because you're supposed to remain seat belted at all times in case of turbulence what if my wife was nine months pregnant what if i was an 80 year old man with bad knees what if i had anxiety about unbuckling so the wife i'm sorry the flight attendant never said anything and my question to you guys is, what is the proper etiquette? I did a lot of internet searches, couldn't find an answer. Uh, passengers in its 20s, my wife and I are in our mid 50s. We're in good shape, so it wasn't a health issue. But I thought this man was an entitled young man who's never been told no in his life. Yeah. Whew. All right, that's from Frank. Okay. So what do you say? Uh, I mean, <laughs> Frank, I think yes, you were the a-hole in this in this instance. Oh, for sure. Well. Here's what I'll wait, say. Wait, wait, no, I have to explain. I can't just be like, oh, sure. yeah, there you go. Okay. That's my judgment. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, Chuck. It sounded like you were done. No, so, like, the, the, the it, it seems like you were put out um, because you're being asked to do something you didn't want to do. It didn't have anything to do with your comfort level. And the examples that you came up with for um, that man intruding on your comfort level were just made up. Like, you're not 80, your wife isn't right. pregnant. You were just sure. annoyed. That guy sounded like he had like a real thing about pushing past people's knees, maybe touching other people, physical contact. Sounds like he was not into that at all. Some people are not into that to a clinical degree. And I feel yeah. like whoever's more put out, um, you should just defer to him. It just makes things so much more pleasant than saying no to somebody who's asking you to do something for them that really is no skin off of your back at all. So I don't think you are an a-hole like necessarily, but I think in this case, if there was an a-hole, it, <laughs> it, it was you. Okay. Okay, Chuck, now I'm done. Well, I, I uh, agree in that my philosophy is, is two part. Uh, one is, you know, you're all on this plane together. Everyone's crammed in there. And it's just one of those social situations where I think everyone should just do their best to just work it all out and get along mm -hmm. while you're done in that short time that you're forced to be rammed in there together. Mm -hmm. You know, like just help each other out. It's just a lot easier, a lot less friction. No one likes to be on those planes anyway. Uh, and then the second part is, I think there's an implicit thing where if you're an aisle seat person, I'm an aisle seat person, mm -hmm. uh, you know that you're going to have to get up and let people out. Like I like an aisle seat at a concert and at a sports game, and you're going to get up and down a lot and let people in who have to use the bathroom or get their beer or whatever. And it's the same on a plane. Like, you know what you're getting into with an aisle seat. That's if you want it, I love that aisle seat, but you gotta, you, you know, what's coming. Uh, otherwise you could sit by the window and that's what you do. If you, you know, like I'm just, I'm going to sleep. I know I don't pee on airplanes. I don't want to be bothered, so I'll just take that window seat. Mm -hmm. So that's my thing is you know what you're getting into. If you're in an aisle seat, you're going to have to get up. I think people should always get up. It's just easier. I don't like sliding my crotch or my butt past somebody's face. What? At all. Ever. So, like, it's a reasonable thing, I think, to say, you know, would you mind just standing up and letting me in? And uh, that that's what I think. I, um yeah. There was one so other. <laughs> there was one other red flag that I, I that caught my attention was when um, Frank suggested that this guy was just an entitled young man who no one had said no to in his life. Um, that sounds then that you were doing this out of hostility, not just because you felt like you were being put out, but because you wanted to um, be an obstacle in this man's life, be the person who said no to him. And again, that's just hostile. And I agree with you. It flies in the face of just going along and getting along while we're on this flight together so everybody can get off and never see each other again. 
Yeah. And we weren't there, so the kid may have been very sarcastic and nodded and acted like sort of a jerk, but he may have thought that you drew first blood. <laughs> True. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's where we stand. And Frank, you're certainly not an a-hole. You you're right. You sound like a sweet guy who listens to this show and it means a lot to you, so we're not... We're not calling you out for that, but I mean, it's not <laughs> he just... literally wrote in and asked. <laughs> but you did ask, and, uh, and and that's our stance: is just get out, let the guy out, yeah, live and let live. Yeah. And if you see that same twenty-year-old kid asking some old person who has bad knees, like, then that's a different situation. Totally you know? different. We were responding strictly to the to the situation as it was presented. Okay. Yeah. All right. Boy, we could have a whole other show where we did this. We could. I think we would routinely get ourselves into trouble, though. Yeah. Instead, listen to uh, the ultimate judge, uh, our friend Judge John Hodgman. Mm -hmm. On what, the Max Fun Network? That's right. Nice. Uh, well, since we uh, shouted out the Max Fun Network and I already ended the episode and now listener mail's over, uh, if you want to be like Frank, Frank, by the way, thank you for being brave and putting yourself out there like that. Um, if you want to put yourself out there like that, you can give it a shot. Maybe we'll answer it. Who knows? Uh, either way, you can give it a try by sending an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.